Hello, and welcome to the Diction Police by the Book, our webinar series on lyric diction. I'm your host, Ellen Rissinger, an American vocal coach accompanist currently on the music staff of the Zempel Oper in Dresden, Germany. And my partner in crime today is vocal coach Dr. Francois Germain, a native French and German speaker who grew up in Aix-en-Provence and studied French diction with Rosemarie Landry. Francois is assistant professor at the Crane School of Music at SUNY Potsdam, and also teaches diction at the University of Ottawa. Thanks for joining us, Francois. Hi, Ellen. Happy to be back with you uh, one last time for French diction. <laughs> Today is our fourth and final lesson on French diction in this series, and we want to thank everyone who's tuned in and sent us comments and questions. Even though this is the final installment of this series, you can always ask us questions at our Facebook page or directly at our website, www dictionpolice.com. We've covered all the basic rules of pronunciation in the first three episodes, so our focus today is on what we call gourmet diction, subjects that can really add nuance and detail to your performance. Yes, we'll be covering a few broad topics like word stress and style, as well as uh, a selection of more particular elements uh, like the treatment of foreign words and names in French and uh, what I would call exotic spellings. And exotic is obviously code for complicated. <laughs> and goodness knows there is enough complication in French spelling to go around. But I thought we'd start off today by talking about the stress of the language. In French IPA transcriptions, we don't use that little diacritical marking to indicate stressed syllables. So how are we supposed to handle this? Well, there is a, a common idea that French is somehow an unaccented language, uh, that we don't really use word stresses. And I've actually heard this phrase most often from French people. That's possible, but it's actually not true. And French uh, does ha uh, have word stresses and uses them. In words of two syllables or more, the stress will always fall on the last syllable, unless that last syllable is a mute schwa, in which case the stress will fall on the previous syllable. The unstressed syllables in the word remain very even and the intensity of the stress itself is much lighter than it is in most of the languages that we sing in. And that's probably where the idea of French being unaccented comes from. Another thing to note is that when we deal with a group of words that are grammatically related, the main stress will be carried by the last word in the group and on the last syllable of that word. Uh, I think this is useful for singers as it will give them a sense of direction and something to aim for in that word group. Uh, and also always remember that all the other syllables should remain quite even. Let's look at some examples of this. Uh, if we take two individual words, here we have paysage and choisi, the stress will fall on the last syllable unless there's a mutua. So for paysage, I have my stress on za because of the mutua that follows. And on choisi, the stress is on the last syllable because there is no mutua there. That's a sort of very straightforward process. Now, if we put these same two words in a broader context and create word groupings, uh, things change a little bit. Here from Claire de Lune by Fauré, we have votre âme est un paysage choisi. And you notice that we're removing the emphasis that we had on paysage and we only keep the one at the end of choisi because that is the last word of that group. And we put the emphasis on the last syllable of that word. Uh, I would say that in here we have two word groups. We have votre âme and then est un paysage choisi. So we'll, we'll have essentially two uh, stresses in this sentence. Now, as you said, uh, you realize also, and you see here, that we don't indicate emphasis in French IPA. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there are no stresses. You just have to know how to handle them. So as opposed to English, where we tend to emphasize the beginning of the sentence and trail off at the end, in French, we're actually heading for the end of the phrase or sentence. And of course, I just said end of the phrase or sentence. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's correct. It's, uh, it's quite a different approach in French. Now, there are also two special cases to mention when the stress won't be on the last syllable of the word. The first one we already talked about is when you have a mute E. 
In speech, mute E's are not an issue because we don't pronounce them at all. But in singing, composers often choose to have these mute E's actually pronounced and sung, or these mute schwas, rather. We addressed this in our second episode on mixed vowels, but I think it bears repeating that sounded final schwa should be treated as what I call a vanishing or release vowel and never, never be accented. An accented mute schwa sounds particularly inelegant and heavy in French and needs to really be avoided. And if we come back to our example uh, that we had earlier, paysage choisi, in the song context, the schwa is pronounced, but it will not be emphasized. In uh, Va, Le Secou de Mes Larmes from uh, Werther by Massenet, this is particularly important at the end of the aria, where Charlotte sings, Et trop fragile, tout le brise. And you can note where the two stresses are, but also that those schwas are sung, but should not be emphasized. Not, Et trop fragile, tout le brise, but, Et trop fragile, tout le brise. And I know we said this before too. One of the difficulties about this is that it's set on a different pitch than came before. So it's helpful that we don't accidentally accent this sound just because the pitch changes. And, and here, especially the word brise, brise is a perfect example of this. Yes, pitch change is, is tricky in that context. And that's uh, a spot where you always have to be more careful. Now, the other uh, scenario we can have where we don't have the accent on the last syllable uh, is on what we call accent d'insistance, or uh, an insistence uh, stress, which we also have in other languages. Um, this is what we do to highlight a particular word in any language. But in French, uh, this can be done in a particular way where we will actually misplace the usual stress on the wrong syllable of the word in order to call the uh, to call attention to that word. Now, this is a, a very interesting way of highlighting the text, and it's also very powerful because it really gets our attention. Uh, but it should also be used with moderation; otherwise, the language will start to sound a bit distorted. I was just going to say this is something to be very careful with and to use sparingly because we don't want to give the impression that we're accenting a accenting a syllable because we don't know how the language flows but rather that we're accenting one syllable to make a specific point. Yes, the, the danger, I think, is, is uh, if you do this too much, is that you will sound like you're putting the emphasis on the wrong syllable by mistake, and exactly. we don't want that. Exactly. Composers often write this into their music, too. Someone like Massonet, who adds tenuti markings on syllables that we would think of as unstressed. So are we making this accent by lengthening the consonants, or is there another way that we can make this accent of insistence? Well, if you remember our discussion on vowels in the previous episodes, uh, vowel sounds in French are already as long as they possibly can be within the musical context. So we can really use vowel length in singing to uh, make these accents. I think the, uh, the, the stress accents or uh, accent insistence or whatever stress you're uh, using uh, are more a matter of intensity of the syllable we're highlighting, uh, almost like a, a, a slight swell of the, of the sound or a little bit more energy in the vowel. Mm -hmm. Let's look at this example from Werther by Massenet, the famous, famous tenor aria. Pourquoi me réveiller au souffle du printemps? Pourquoi me réveiller? And as you said, Massenet uh, writes a lot of tenuities uh, in, in his uh, scores, and you have to always be, be very um, diligent about observing them. And here we see one uh, at the beginning of réveiller, then on du, and then on the next pourquoi. And if we really do these, it actually changes the, the natural, uh, I would say, pattern of stresses that we would have normally. If I were to say this, Without these uh, accents d'insistance, it would sound like this. Pourquoi me réveiller au souffle du printemps? Pourquoi me réveiller? But he wants, Pourquoi me réveiller au souffle du printemps? Pourquoi me réveiller? And you can really particularly notice the difference between the two, uh, the two pourquoi in there. The first one is pourquoi, and the second one, 
Pourquoi, which really brings a lot of attention to that, that question. Well, and it's not even just within the same word. I mean, if we're going in terms of phrases, we would have réveillé, and here we've actually shifted the entire accent of the phrase to the very beginning. That's correct, and it's really it really highlights that that word réveiller to to wake up. You know, that's 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 a very powerful highlighting tool. Yeah. Um, this is also something that you can do, by the way, even when the composer doesn't write it as a as a an expressive device uh, and or, an artistic choice. Uh, here, I have an example that that can be very interesting to uh, to implement in Chanson Triste by Du Parc. If I were to say this without the accent assistance, it would sound like this. Tu prendras ma tête malade, where the emphasis is on the la syllable at the end, malade. But in order to highlight that malade word, you can also say, tu prendras ma tête malade, which really puts that uh, into a sharp, uh, 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 into a sharp light. Now, I would uh, say here that just from this discussion, we can already see that French is really not as flat as we might sometimes think, because we're already discussing a lot of possibilities for accents. Uh, and this actually also brings me to uh, the idea of style in French and how diction relates to it. I think the, the main concept to keep in mind when discussing style and diction in French is the idea of evenness. Um, because of the way we treat accents, uh, and the vowel-oriented nature of the language, we constantly have to strive for the most even legato possible. This is achieved through proper vowel formation, through singing on each vowel sound for as long as possible, and through keeping consonants light and crisp. I like to use the, uh, the image of birds perched on a telephone line. Imagine that the line is our uninterrupted string of vowels, and the birds are consonants that don't break that line, so we have that perfect legato going through. Yeah, I've heard the same analogy, but with a, a clothesline with clothespins on it, a wash line with clothespins. Yeah, that's very good too, and the, the clothespins are actually better because they're, they're smaller, so small, tiny consonants. Yeah, they're smaller, but I like that the birds can fly away, so if we don't need the consonants, we don't have to have them. Well, that's true, there's a lot of sound ones. <laughs> <laughs> so just like we practice Italian arias and songs only on vowels, we can also practice French on vowels to get a good even legato? Absolutely, and this is something that I find very important in the process of learning a French piece, whether it's a melody or an aria. Uh, we should always, always do this with every phrase and every piece. So you will start by speaking your phrase or the little portion of text that you want to work on, you will start by speaking that on vowels alone, just to make it clear what those vowels are. Once you've done that, I would intone these vowels close to your singing range. Uh, what do while you, you do this, intoning? What, what, is, what does intone mean? Intoning is uh, it's, it's sort of a halfway between speaking and singing. It's sort of using uh, our support and uh, speaking long vowels on the air. It would sound like this. So no real melody, but close to a, a singing feeling. Okay. Now, while you do this, uh, your goal is to make sure that you don't separate your vowels in any way. Vowels should really sound like one is melding into the next. And you also don't preoccupy yourself with rhythm at this point because uh, you want to make every vowel feel like it's a long sound. And once you've done this, once you've done this intone, intoning on just the vowels, you can do the same thing with your pitches and your rhythms, but still without consonants. So it would work like this. This is from Ici Bas by Fauré, and our verse is Je rêve au baiser qui demeure. Our first job is to extract all, all of the vowel sounds from there. And here we have E, E, O, E, E, I, E, E, E. And then you would intone that, making sure that you uh, you really keep your legato as smooth as possible. And it would sound like this. And you notice that I don't really mark the precise moment where those vowels shift. Especially in the last word where, if we remember, the schwa is the same thing as the OE that last word, those last three syllables are the exact same vowel. 
That's correct. So the last three syllables will sound like this. Uh, <laughs> just one <laughs> long uh. <laughs> this is from Sigudi by uh, Bizet from Carmen. So again, uh, we have our sentence. Je n'ai guère le temps d'attendre car avec mon nouvel amant, you extract all your vowels and then you intone that whole uh, selection of vowels. And it's not always easy right away because um, you might already have a certain amount of muscle memory built in around the words and the consonants, but it's worth taking the time to really uh, go through that string of vowels. It, it, it has to feel almost like you just came back from the dentist and you still have a little bit of lidocaine in your mouth so that things uh, are very smoothly moving from one vowel to the next. Exactly. Well, and, and once you feel how close these, these vowels are together, you can really find an economy of movement in creating the vowels. And especially for this last example where Carmen is trying to sound very nonchalant, this can really help find the position that creates that feeling that you're looking for in singing without even doing anything, with actually trying to do less. Absolutely. And I think this is a great exercise for several reasons. Uh, first, it forces you to clarify your vowel sounds. You, you, won't, you won't be able to do this un unless you have a really clear idea of what the vowels are. Uh, it shows you, like you said, which vowels are the same or closely related. And it also helps in identifying the common space between all these vowel sounds, even the ones that are not uh, the same or closely related and also to realize that your articulators don't have to work as hard as you think. Uh, I think it makes the, the flurry of French vowels much more manageable and it absolutely enhances the quality of the legato. Uh, maybe we can look at an example where we have vowels that are far apart. This is from Isiba by Foré. So we would have And the distance between E and I in theory is pretty much as far as you can get in the spectrum. But when you do this exercise, you realize that there's not that much that actually changes between the two vowels and that the space inside remains pretty similar for all these sounds. Exactly, what we're trying to avoid between this E and A is that sort of click that happens. If the, if the A goes too far back, we get E, A, E, A, and suddenly you can hear how far apart the vowels can become but we're really going for a smooth relationship between the vowels, so that the tongue moves smoothly and we don't hear that, I call it a click, because I feel like I feel the click when it goes into that new position. Yes, absolutely, no clicking in French. <laughs> <laughs> so once you get a hang of this, uh, you can then intone on the full text, including the consonants, and your goal will be to retain that vowel connection even with those consonants present. And then finally, once we've done that, then you can sing your phrase the way it's written, putting back a sense of the word stresses and the consonants and the rhythm just as the piece is written. One phrase that I've heard in relation to French style is the style soutenu. When we use that phrase, what are we really talking about? And are there other styles that we should be aware of that affect our diction? So, still soutenu refers to the level of uh, refinement of the language, whether in writing or in speech. The way we speak on the street, for instance, would be called uh, style familier, sort of colloquial style. But in literature and poetry particularly, we use a heightened form of the language. So, the still soutenu is a refined way to write, but also to deliver a text. And most of the stylistic, stylistic principles we are talking about uh, today relate to this style. It is interesting to note that in cases where our text is not in this heightened form and maybe in a more colloquial folkloric style, then we can, uh, we can and we should make some adjustments to the way we approach the diction, especially when it comes to something like optional liaison. Uh, in a piece like Ravel's Greek folk songs, for instance, uh, we will use less liaison than we would uh, in poetry by Verlaine or Baudelaire, for instance. Uh, but I will also add to this that the quality of line and legato and the treatment of vowels and stresses uh, will essentially be the same, uh, no matter what uh, level of language you're talking about, no matter what style we're looking at. 
one major feature in French opera and art song is that we get a whole lot of crazy rhythms, a lot more than we do in German and Italian. When you think of an Italian recitative, we all know that it'll be in 4-4 four, four with mostly 8th and 16th notes, and the important words will be on 1 and 3 of the measure. But in, for example, Peleas et Melisande, in the recitatives and in the arias proper, we get lots of triplets and quadruplets and quintuplets going back and forth with more sort of, quote, normal rhythms. Yes, and this is where uh, our concept of evenness that we've been talking about also applies to rhythm. In French, we have to approach rhythm in a very horizontal way. I always give the example of uh, triplets. Normally, we would kind of uh, pulse our triplets to feel that ternary quality. Like you would say, triplet, triplet, with a little bit of a, an emphasis on the first one. But in French, each note of the triplet has to be equal to the others and feel very horizontal. So the shifts between rhythm figures within one line should be barely perceptible, almost like they just blend in and out of each other, kind of like our concept of blending in and out of our vowels. That's what we want to do with our rhythms as well, no matter how complicated they are. So this is from uh, the very end of La Flûte de Pan from the Chanson de Bilitis by Debussy. And you can see these uh, rhythms that are look at first glance pretty complicated. Now, if I were to say this uh, in rhythm with an emphasis of the rhythmic quality of it, it would sound like this. Ma mère ne croira jamais que je suis resté si longtemps à chercher ma ceinture perdue. We well, can really hear that slight pulsing of the rhythm. But the proper way to approach this in French would be to eliminate uh, these pulses while retaining the integrity and the precision of the rhythm. Ma mère ne croira jamais que je suis resté si longtemps à chercher ma ceinture perdue. So we aren't trying to consciously mark the beats with our diction. As young musicians, we, we learn to stress syllables on the beat to make sure that we stay in rhythm. But in French music, especially when the rhythm looks complicated like this, we aren't trying to emphasize the rhythm, right? We're, we're really just trying to get the natural flow of the language without feeling the rhythm. That's correct. And I will add that the rhythm does have to be exact and as written on the page by the composer, who really took great pains in transcribing the way uh, he heard the rhythm of the poetry in the text itself. And, and you are right, we, we don't want to make it sound rhythmic. The complex rhythm is there, but we really should not notice it. Now, uh, finally, to close up this chapter on evenness, uh, the, this idea of evenness is also important for our phrasing and how we handle it. The phrase in French unfolds, I, I would say, in long, smooth arches without the ups and downs that we can have in Italian, for instance, or the more jagged nature that can occur in English or German sometimes. We really have to have these long horizontal lines that tend to go towards the end uh, of the verse all the time. We were talking before about vowels and how they relate to each other. And the one subject that needs to be brought up in that regard is the concept of vocalic harmonization. Yes, and like the treatment of the French R, if you remember our previous episode, this is a topic that is actually a source of some debate among singers and coaches. Uh, but maybe before getting into the, the core of the controversy, I'll, I'll explain what it actually is. So vocalic harmonization is the process by which an unstressed open vowel becomes more closed because the vowel that follows it is closed. This happens to vowels for which both an open and a closed version exists mostly open a and closed a, but also the o, e, and o slash, and sometimes the open o and the closed o. For example, the word um, aimer, to love in French, should basically be pronounced aimer with a, an open a first, but it can be harmonized to something closer to aimer, where the first vowel will sound almost like a closed a. Now, the key word here is more closed, meaning that the open vowel does not turn entirely into its closed counterpart, but it just gets closer to it. Uh, it's also important to know that it doesn't happen in the other direction, meaning a, vowel, a closed vowel will never become more open because it's followed by an open vowel. 
Uh, incidentally, harmonization happens in speech quite a bit, so much so that uh, we have lost a fair number of open vowels in the language. A word like maison, which technically should have an open e, is very commonly pronounced maison because of this closing of the initial vowel. So it doesn't even have to be the same word, I mean, the same vowel sound. It doesn't have to be an open air turning into a clo because the following one is a closed E. No, that's correct. It's, it's more a matter of whether that second uh, syllable has a closed vowel in it, no matter what that vowel is. Okay. Um, and also the, the plural articles, le deseme. Yes, le deseme, which uh, if, if you've uh, followed the previous episodes, we've, we've said these articles should be open to the open e. Eh. Well, in speech, we'll commonly pronounce them with a closed e uh, for the same reason. They've, they've become harmonized to that closed vowel. Now, uh, this happens in speech, but it's also a, a process that can be applied to lyric diction. Uh, I think in an effort to simplify and unify the vowel sounds in that quest for even legato. So from Juliet's Waltz uh, by Gounod, from Romeo et Juliette, the very first words she sings are je veux vivre, which technically should have that schwa as the first sound. And uh, you can definitely harmonize this to je veux vivre, where the first open schwa will be turned to the O slash. And this is something that you hear people do. Here's another example from G Green uh, by Debussy. Laissez-la s'apaiser de la bonne tempête becomes laissez-la s'apaiser de la bonne tempête. And one last one here from Lydia by Forêt. Les délices comme un essaim becomes les délices comme un essaim. This is an example of one of those plural articles becoming closed uh, because the next word has a closed vowel in it. Exactly. So, and what we're saying here is that the versions with vocalic harmonization are options, but we don't have to use them. We could use also the original transcriptions too. That's absolutely correct. And I, I will add to that, that personally, I don't think we really need to harmonize all that much if we form our vowels properly and realize that they all live pretty close together. Uh, also, if we don't overuse our articulators and don't chew our diction, uh, the feeling that we need to uh, unify the vowels artificially will not be as urgent anymore because we'll already have that sense that there is a lot of common space between the sounds. And like you said, this is a topic that can be a source of debate because now we're getting into things where the rules aren't hard and fast. And we will hear singers perform these texts both with and without harmonization. Yes, and personally, I love the variety of sounds that lyric diction allows us. Uh, if you listen to the great French singers of the last century, especially Pierre Bernac or Gérard Souzet, uh, who are to this day great references for this repertoire, you will notice that they really don't harmonize all that much. Now, this being said, if you do decide to harmonize words like aimé and paysage and pronounce them aimé and paysage, it will still sound French, and no one will give you a hard time for doing this. I think it's more a, a matter of uh, personal artistic decision and maybe how these sounds feel within uh, a particular voice. If we look these words up in a dictionary, what will we find in the IPA there? Because we always talk about going to a good reference for this kind of information. Yes, well, for some of these words, you will find both options in some dictionaries. But most of the time, you will find the closed harmonized version because that's the one that is more current in speech. Uh, and this is particularly true for plural articles. So I think it's always a good idea to remember that a lot of these words, when it comes to singing and lyric diction, can actually use an open vowel, which a lot of the time is uh, better vocally anyway. And since we're on controversial topics already, <laughs> why don't we spend a little more time talking about the French R? Yes, uh, we've talked about it at length in our previous episode, but I guess we haven't really exhausted the topic. <laughs> and here I will go from the assumption that we are using the flipped R uh, in this discussion. And by flipped, I mean really one or at most two flips of the tip of the tongue. Not more, otherwise we enter into rolled R territory, and that's always something we want to avoid in French. 
just a side note, by the way, if you listen to French popular singers of the last century, like Edith Piaf or Mireille Mathieu or Jacques Brel, uh, you'll notice that they use a, a very interesting R, which is the trilled uvular R. Uh, and they, uh, they make it quite prominent in a lot of their songs. Um, so go, to lis go listen to um, La Vie en Rose or Amsterdam to, to hear what I mean. <laughs> Now, one big difficulty with the flipped R is that it's not a very strong sound, especially when it is between a vowel and a consonant, or vice versa, between a consonant and a vowel. So in those cases, it can sometimes be very hard to project to the point that it almost sounds like there is no R at all. And this, when it happens, gives the language a very peculiar flavor that we want to avoid, and it makes it also hard to understand. Now, the solution to the problem is not rolling, which would sound too Italian. It's also not uh, a hard flip, which would create tension. I'm not exactly sure how that would work anyway. Uh, the solution, I think, or something that works really well, is to practice these passages by adding a little shadow vowel between the R and the consonant. First, slowly and deliberately, by adding almost uh, an entire syllable for the shadow vowel, and then as you speed up gradually to the normal tempo, you make that little shadow vowel disappear. Let's look at how this works in the repertoire. This is Les Berceaux by Forêt. Here we have Ne prenne pas garde au berceau. And you can see the in garde and berceau, we have two cases where the R is stuck between a vowel and a consonant. And if you don't, uh, do anything about that, it's very possible that it will sound like this. Ne prenne pas garde au berceau, where the R is almost not there at all. So the way you would practice this is first slowly, ne prenne pas garde au berceau, garde au berceau. And you notice that for that shadow vowel, I use the French schwa, which is sort of our neutral vowel in French. Um, but of course, you're not going to sing it like this with this added syllable. So when you put it back into the rhythm context, you will make that shadow vowel very short and almost disappear. So in rhythm, this would go like this initially. Ne prenne pas garde berceau. This is where I do a lot of it. But if I do a little bit less of it, ne prenne pas garde berceau. And it just really leaves you with a beautifully articulated R. Yeah, it's. I would call it. It releases the R. Like it, you actually you get your tongue up to the top, and you also release the consonant before the next one. That's exactly right. Can this also happen between words? Yes. So we can have the same problem when a word ends with an R and is followed by a word that starts with a consonant, like we have here from Fidilet by Duparc, "La rouge fleur des blés s'incline," and that. R at the end of fleur can be tricky. So if you apply the same process, fleur de, and then fleur de, it'll help release that R and really articulate it. Now, I think that sometimes that shadow vowel can also be helpful when we have the reverse situation where the R is between a consonant first and a vowel second, as we have here uh, in this uh, excerpt from Duguay Soleil from Werther by Duparc, uh, by Massenet rather where we start with the word frère. And it can be very helpful and interesting to add that little bit of schwa feeling between your F and your R at the beginning of this. Frère voyez, instead of frère voyez, which doesn't give you a lot of time to get the F and the R out. Well, it also it would keep us from doing frère and emphasizing yes, it. Which, that's exactly right. So that's the, that would be sort of quote unquote the other solution, which is where you end up rolling your R, which we're trying to avoid. Um, now, sometimes I think that just practicing this way will be enough to get that R out. Uh, and sometimes you will still want to think about a mini shadow vowel in there. Uh, but it's really a great trick because uh, it, it really helps the tongue to get used to that articulation without tension. And the other thing it does is that it adds a little bit of a vowel feeling between two consonants which is really nice for our legato. This should give us a great start on finding our bon goût 
our good taste within the French style. So why don't we move on to some of the crazier spellings in French because there are plenty of them. Sure, so as, as I think we've demonstrated abundantly in our previous episodes, while pronouncing the vowels is the most difficult part of diction, spelling rules are one of the main difficulties in actually learning the French language. So it seemed only fitting to spend a little more time on this subject in our last episode. On top of all the normal spellings we uh, already talked about and that are already pretty complicated, there are a few rare and exotic ones that do come up in the literature, so it is worth mentioning a few of them here. One of my favorites is cueillir, which we use as an example of how a C followed by a U becomes the phonetic K sound. But there's a whole lot more to talk about with this word. Yes, the word cueillir is very interesting. So the U in here only uh, hardens the C to a K and has no phonetic value of its own. The ILL is our spelling or one of the spellings for the J glide. And the E letter is actually pronounced OE. Uh, we see the same exact pattern, or, or very similar pattern, in the word orgueil, where the U is only there to harden the G and doesn't have a phonetic value. The IL at the end is one of the possible spellings for our J glide. And that E letter, again, uh, is pronounced with the OE. And if we go back to our spelling rules from the mixed vowels, the OE is spelled EU and not UE, or I mean, I guess it can be sometimes E alone. But in this case, we see this UE together and we think, oh, this should be EU, right? Yes, you're right. Technically, to have the OE, we should have the U after the E. And I don't know, maybe someone looked at this and thought that Curry with C U E U I looked too crazy and decided <laughs> to drop one of the U's. Um, but I will just add that a word like que, we do have that exact scenario with Q-U-E-U-E, and this doesn't seem to bother anybody, so I don't really know why cueillir is so strange looking. <laughs> now, uh, incidentally, the, the first U in que uh, functions with the Q, and uh, the next E-U is what spells our O-E phonetically, and that last U in here uh, is actually our mutua. In the repertoire, it looks like this, from Villanelle uh, by Berlioz, pour cueillir le muguet au bois. So you can see that these words do actually happen. <laughs> Quite often, actually. <laughs> Quite often, yeah. We, we do tend to pluck or pick a lot of flowers. So. We do. <laughs> and uh, this is from Mandoline by Forêt, leurs longues robes à queue, where you have uh, even more, we have the added silent S at the end, so we have a, a six-letter word that really is just one phonetic sound. And one since album. this poem was set by, what, five million composers, it may not come off, the que may not come up often in the repertoire, but it certainly comes up with five million different versions of Modoline. Yes. So, in short, I think it's, it's just not uncommon to have a lot of vowels in a row that end up spelling only one phonetic sound. Uh, <laughs> Along those lines, we have the word créer, the verb créer, to create. Uh, that's also worth mentioning. Uh, if it's in the infinitive, you'll see it, the first one here, we have two closed A's in a row, créer. And then if you start conjugating, uh, it becomes even more interesting. Je crée can be pronounced either with just a closed A or with the added mute schwa pronounced, je crée. And then I think the crazy looking one is that uh, feminine past participle, créer or créer with two A's with the accent aigu and the mute schwa. <laughs> and again, just as proof that these do happen in the repertoire, this is from Voyage à Paris uh, by Poulenc, qu'un jour du créer l'amour. And you have these two A's in a row and that's, uh, that's, uh, that's just exactly the way it's pronounced, without a glottal. Just don't worry about the two A's in a row. So let's move on to final R, D, R, S, and R, T. This is an interesting case uh, because even French speakers tend to make a mistake here. Uh, first, the D, the S, and the T in these spellings are silent. The problem is, is, the problem is that there is a strong tendency to want to pronounce them in the liaison uh, context. Uh, in fact, the liaison should not happen except maybe when the S is a mark of the plural, or in some cases with the word toujours. 
So if we look at them in the repertoire, we have from uh, Chanson Perpetuelle by Chausson, Sur le bord arrivé, where we don't pronounce the D and we pronounce the R. Here from La Bonne Chanson by Forêt, Qu'à travers un immense espoir, with a silent S and the R pronounced. And here from L'Etoile by Chabrier, Mais surtout fort enrhumé, where the T is silent and the R pronounced. And this word fort, which means very, is the main culprit for uh, French speakers to actually want to pronounce that T. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if most people would say here fort enrhumé in, in speech, but that's actually wrong um, in diction. And I just want to reiterate the point that in all of these examples, we would not do a liaison, and a liaison is in fact not necessary at all because the R is pronounced. Liaison is only when we pronounce a consonant that's normally silent. But even if a if fa were at the end, I should say, when, a, when we pronounce a consonant that's silent at the end of a word because there's no other consonant that's being pronounced. But even if fa were at the end of a phrase or sentence, we would still say that R. That's correct. So it's not a case for liaison at all. Now, toujours is interesting because uh, we will make the liaison only when toujours directly modifies the word that follows. And we will not make it when it's not the case. So this is what it looks like. This is from Au Cimetière by Berlioz. Et qu'on voudrait toujours entendre, where the liaison happens. And here from Colloque Sentimental by Debussy. Ton cœur bat-il toujours à mon seul nom? Where we don't make the liaison in this case. What about the verb ending A-I-E-N-T? Yes, so A-I-E-N-T is the third person plural ending of verbs conjugated in the imparfait past tense or the conditional in French. And it's another case of a lot of, vowel for, a lot of vowels for just one phonetic sound, which in this case is the open E. So if you see this spelling, you know you're dealing with a verb in, in one of these two tenses and that it will be the open E. And we have it here from Si mes vers avaient des ailes by Renaldo Han. Mes vers fuiraient doux et frêles. Si mes vers avaient des ailes, ils voleraient étincelles. All open E's. Now, maybe as a quick reminder, sir, since we're on the verb topic, um, the verb endings ai and while well, the verb ending ai is pronounced with a closed a and the endings ais and ait are pronounced open e we can see this here from rencontre by forêt j'étais triste et pensif quand je t'ai rencontré and you can see the difference between the two this is important incidentally because if you're not reading the text and only hearing it uh, the difference of that vowel sound will actually tell you which tense is being used a lot of the time. Exactly, in a lot of the Romance languages, there's there's a for a, a specific verb tense for things that are going on around you and a specific verb tense for something that's actually happening right at that moment, and we need to make that difference. That's correct, and the, it's a subtle distinction of open or closed vowel sometimes. Yeah. And uh, one last uh, reminder, here for verb endings, if you see the ending ENT, you're dealing with a third person plural, uh, and that will be pronounced uh, with a schwa and not an anasa like you might think it is. And we have it here from Les Berceaux by Forêt. Et que les hommes curieux tentent les horizons qui leur, with two uh, final schwas for these ENTs. And this, is, this can cause confusion with some people because there are words that end with ENT like content or common. And one thing I always recommend is that even if you can't translate every single word of the song yourself, is to make sure to look for the grammatical structures. Because if we recognize that we have a plural verb, a plural noun in, as the subject with the word les, les hommes, then we know that we have to have a plural verb to go along with it. And that makes these E's, the schwa, these ENT endings. That's exactly right. And, and uh, the, the, the knowledge of grammar is always essential to uh, diction and how we apply those rules. There are also a number of specific words with their own rules of pronunciation that come up in the repertoire quite often. Yes, so let's just, just 
go through a few of them quickly. Uh, donc can be pronounced donc or don. It will be donc with the K sounded at the end when you find this word at the beginning of a clause or when, when it's pronounced in liaison in the middle of a clause. And it will be pronounced don without the K when it's at the end of a clause or followed by a consonant in the middle of a clause. And here we have all these cases. From Villanay by Berlioz, vient don sur ce banc de mousse, middle of a clause followed by a consonant. Donc, ce sera par un clair jour d'été, beginning of the clause. And here, our famous example from Carmen by Bizet, frappe-moi donc, and not frappe-moi donc, because it's at the end of the clause. And this is, I think, some. this is one that's worth mentioning because um, French speakers, again, will probably have a tendency to pronounce the K in every case, and that's not um, correct for lyric diction. Exactly, and especially with this Carmen example, it, the question comes up all the time. Yes. Um, another word uh, that has something a little bit similar happen to it is uh, the spelling S-O-I-T. And that can be pronounced swat when it means all right, very well. Uh, and it usually will be at the beginning or the end of a clause. But it can also be pronounced swa with the T silent when it means or, or when it is the subjunctive case of the verb être, um, the, verb, the verb to be. From Carmen again, soit on paiera, but here from Green by Debussy, l'humble présent soit doux, with the silent T. And I usually, for me, I look at it as the, the difference between so be it, and then I would say the T, soit, so be it, and the other one as sort of may it be. So the T is sort of swallowed in the middle of the phrase. That's how I remember it. That's exactly right. Uh, now, T-O-U-S, again, we can have two possibilities here, can be either tu when it's an article or tous when it's a pronoun. From Au bord de l'eau by Forêt, s'asseoir tous deux au bord du flot qui passe, silent S, but from Carmen by Bizet, nous le connaissons tous. And this one can cause some confusion because in the phrase before it, Michaela sings, le connaissez-vous? And somehow people are surprised that nous le connaissons tous is the answer to this. And vous and tous don't rhyme, but they really don't rhyme. The word really is tous with the S pronounced. That's exactly right. They do not rhyme. And this is definitely the pronoun and it should definitely be pronounced with the S. And as a side note, when you're learning a French opera, and instead of a character name that you recognize, it says tous above the text, learn it. It means that everyone on stage sings that line. I have done a few shows a long time ago where no one learned that one line because it didn't have their character name above it. It said tous. Yeah, that, that can be quite unfortunate if you realize uh, that on the day of the rehearsal. Exactly. <laughs> Now, a similar grammatical distinction comes into play with notre when it's an article and notre, the pronoun. And the same thing happens with votre and votre. So when we're saying the article of the pronoun, we're talking about the difference between saying, is this our car? And the answer being, yes, it's ours. That's right. So just remember that a, a pronoun stands, stands in for a noun, while um, an article or an adjective have to modify a noun. Again, we can see the need for a little bit of grammatical analysis here. So, notre is pronounced with the open O, and notre is pronounced with the closed O, and that's the one that has the uh, accent circonflex over it. And that actually makes this easier because in this case, you don't really need to know the, your grammar very well. If you see the, the accent circonflex, you'll just have the closed O. But it doesn't hurt to know that one is an article and the other one is a pronoun. This is from Notre Amour by Forêt. Notre Amour est chose légère, with the open A. And from L'Excel Extase by Debussy, c'est la nôtre dit, n'est-ce pas? With a real nice closed O. And now they're talking about this new spelling reform and taking out the accent circonflex, but these cases are, are not included in that, right? I mean, they're not taking out the accents that would affect the pronunciation, just the ones that have no effect on pronunciation. 
Yes, and also the ones that have no grammatical reason uh, reason of being, uh, and this this actually makes a distinction between these two words. So this is one accent that would actually stay there. Okay. Uh, another case of interesting words here: uh, un, aucun, and chacun are all pronounced with that oe nasal at the end, and they all look very similar. But you have to remember that we treat them differently in liaison. Un and aucun, being articles, will trigger the liaison and retain the nasality, but chacun will not trigger the liaison because it's a pronoun and not an article anymore. Uh, and I like to bring this one up uh, because of this piece, which is actually not from the French repertoire, uh, but is uh, very common. This is from Die la Maus by Strauss. Chacun a son goût. And really we should not make the liaison here and I've, I've heard it made before but that's actually not correct another word that comes up uh, is s-e-n-s which can be pronounced sans and in this case will will mean uh, to feel to smell or sans with the s pronounced and in this case it actually means uh, direction or sense this is from Autonne by Forêt Je sens au clair soleil du souvenir vainqueur, with the S silent. And from Ensourdine by Forêt, in nos sens extasiés, where the S is pronounced. And we pronounce it because, as an S, because that's actually the word. If we were saying je sens and the next word would make liaison, then it would have a Z as the liaison consonant, right? That's correct. This remains an S because the S is actually sounded in the word itself, so it's not a liaison. There are two words that come up quite often in poetry, and especially in opera, that we should know because of their exceptional pronunciation. Hélas and jadis. Yes, they do come up often, and what you have to remember is that the S is pronounced. This is uh, from Michaela's aria, Jeudi, uh, from Carmen. De celui que j'aimais jadis. And you really have to pronounce that final S. And I want to add in here that j'aimais is not jamais. This is another thing that we often have to correct in this phrase. Yes, because jamais means never and j'aimais means I loved. So you want to make sure you get it right. <laughs> exactly. Um, another example here is from Spleen by Debussy. Et du luis en buis je suis là, et de tout fort de vous, hélas. And again, that hélas has the pronounced final S, and you have to resist the urge of wanting to uh, make it rhyme with la, even if the words look similar or that they might be related, they're actually not related. So this does not need to rhyme. There's one more word that we should talk about, but I've only ever seen it in mob, the letters OS. Yeah, OS, the word for uh, bone in French. Uh, un os de grillon sert de manche. Uh, it's an interesting case because when it's in the singular, it will be pronounced os with open o and s, but when it's in, when it's in the plural, it will turn into des o, o, with just a closed o and no s anymore. This, this actually follows the same rule as oeuf and boeuf from before, right? Yes, if you remember, we had un oeuf, des oeufs, un boeuf, des boeufs, and here we have un os, des o, same idea. To finish off the series, we wanted to talk about some foreign words that come up often in the repertoire. Yes, yeah, so the French are notorious for Frenchifying, I would say, foreign names. <laughs> if you watched our second episode, you probably heard me say Mozart instead of Mozart. <laughs> and we do that a whole lot, especially with composers' names. So most of the time, there is not even a, an attempt to get close to the original language. Uh, and this is an interesting situation for, for us in, in, in singers, uh, because a lot of the pieces that we deal with are actually inspired by foreign lands and therefore replete with foreign names and words. <laughs> and of course, one of the best places to find foreign words is in the opera Carmen. Yes, and uh, some of the words that are interesting to mention in there are uh, manzanilla, zingara, and torero. And for manzanilla, uh, you know, if the best case scenario is the first spelling we have here, the first IPA, manzanilla. But you will often hear it with a hint of that nasal vowel still there, manzanilla. And for zingara, uh, 
Zingara would be the, the better option, but very often you'll hear it Zingara without that initial D in front of the Z sound. So and even we definitely, we definitely don't want the N nasal in this case either. No, absolutely. It's not Zangara. That would be really, really bad. But uh, we're, we're trying to get close to the original pronunciation, but we, we can't quite do it right. Um, and the last word is actually a little bit different because Torero is a word that has been adopted into the French language. So this one is, is really pronounced with all the, the French rules. Uh, and most notably, you don't actually pronounce the final S. Uh, it's a silent S as a mark of the poor in French. Torero. Debussy also has two songs whose titles look like English, spleen and green. Are these really English words or should we try to Frenchify their pronunciation? Well, spleen won't be an issue because it's it's easy uh, for French for the French to actually say that, spleen. Uh, but green, you're very likely to hear it with the uvular R, green, when someone pronounces the title instead of green. There are also proper names that come up and need to be handled. Yeah, so we can uh, look at this example from Fantoche by Debussy, where we have these two characters from the Commedia dell'arte, Scaramouche and Pulcinella. And here you notice that Scaramouche has already been turned into French completely, uh, but Pulcinella has retained the Italian spelling. And traditionally, we will sing this Pulcinella, which is one of the rare attempts at really staying true to the original language that we find in the repertoire. Uh, but even then, you can tell that we're, we're not, we don't get complete, we don't get it completely right, uh, because we, for instance, we won't even attempt the the double L in here. We're we're not going to sing Pulcinella, but really Pulcinella, which is sort of a, a hybrid of a French Italian pronunciation, really. Um, another good example that uh, comes up is uh, the title of this uh, operetta by Offenbach, La Grande Duchesse de Gerolstein. And this is obviously a German name, it should be Gerolstein, but you will always find it in one of the three ways here, either is uh, Gerolstein, Gerolstein in the worst cases, and sometimes Gerolstein. And they are all actually acceptable. Really? Because there's no, there's no one more correct than the others? Not really. I think the, the worst one would be the middle one, Gerolstein, where we use that nasal vowel in there, but uh, <laughs> they're all pretty far off. Yeah, I have to say, I'd never heard of this opera before. And for me, Gerolsteiner is, is a kind of water. So as soon as you mentioned this, I thought, hmm, OK. <laughs> yeah, it's, just, it's an interesting example of how we, uh, we butcher foreign names in general. <laughs> so in short, I think if you see foreign words in French, uh, and particularly foreign names, your first reflex should probably, probably be to uh, pronounce them according to the rules of French diction unless there is an established tradition that you know of to do otherwise and to pronounce them close to the original language. And this is really a place to find a good reference resource that has a li list of proper names and their pronunciation in French. Yes, that's a very good idea. And you can also, uh, I'm always a big fan to uh, listen and listen to great singers, you know, uh, great French singers and see what they do. And sometimes you'll find several options for just one topic. And that's always interesting. Exactly. Thank you, Francois, for leading us through French diction for the past couple of weeks. Well, you're very welcome. It was a pleasure to be with you. And thank you all so much for joining us at the Diction Police by the book. We hope that you've enjoyed this series and will join us again next time. In the meantime, make sure to check out www.dictionpolice.com for the latest podcast episodes and to see the latest additions to our repertoire of text readings by native speakers and IPA transcriptions. You can also follow the Diction Police on Twitter at Diction Police and our Facebook page where you'll find our Tongue Twisters for Singers series, diction tips, and weekly diction lessons. We're currently working on setting up our webinar on German lyric diction, so see you then.